I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com or phone us at 604-924-5504. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Jordan Bateman, the VC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Welcome back to the show, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Jim. So, government waste awards, always a fun time of year. Who's been the most wasteful out there? No, oh, these are our 19th annual Petty Waste Awards. Um, this is a really the signature event of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation's year. Uh, we uh, we take the uh, Charles Lynch Press Theatre um, on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Our federal director this year, Aaron Woodrick, and uh, our pig mascot, Porky the Waste Hater, they go out there and, and present the awards. So a number of nominees, um, but the winners this year, um, yeah, a couple of uh, Ontario uh, winners, but uh, the city of Victoria also won the Municipal Award for its Bungled Blue Bridge Project. And for the first time in uh, Teddy Waste Award history, um, the mayor of the uh, city that won the Municipal Waste Award didn't argue with it, actually said it was well-deserved. So uh, we, were, uh, we were pretty shocked to hear the, uh, the mayor agree with us. What kind of numbers are we talking about here with the Blue Bridge? Yeah, the Blue Bridge, um, so uh, for people who have been to Victoria and, or live in Victoria, uh, it, this is the uh, small bridge that uh, connects kind of the area by Dockside Green there um, with the uh, the main downtown itself. It's about 100 meters, uh, the span. It goes over the harbor that's still used for some industrial purposes, so the bridge has to lift. Um, it's replacing the old, well, 93-year-old Johnson Street Bridge, the blue bridge that is uh, there currently. Anyways, back in 2009, uh, Victoria City Council said it would cost about $63 million to uh, replace that bridge. Um, but then they just kept screwing up, wrote a terrible contract, made a terrible deal, uh, ended up with some major steel problems, uh, offended the Chinese factory that was making that steel, and now that price tag has ballooned to uh, more than $105 million, uh, $42 million over budget already, and uh, just as bad, a full three years behind schedule. So the joke we like to make is, you know, a 100-meter bridge, Usain Bolt could run that in about nine and a half seconds, but uh, the dolts at Victoria City Hall have managed to blow, uh, you know, 105 million dollars trying to bridge it. Well, one of the problems, isn't it, that they wanted a unique bridge, something that hadn't been done before in the world? Yeah, exactly. So you know, these guys get big projectitis, I call it, where you know they want that shiny, you know, architectural wonder that they can point to and, and make themselves feel great. Um, you know, especially in Victoria, where obviously there is a lot of pressure to to be green and innovative. You know, maybe they felt the pressure, like, why are you building a car bridge at all? Um, you know, is this just going to induce more traffic? All those usual kind of complaints you hear from the, uh, the uh, Gregor Robertson type bike crowd. Anyways, they decide to build this bridge. It's, be- it's going it's, I mean, it's to be beautiful when it's built. Um, it should be for $105 million. Um, kind of this sloping white uh, railing system. Um, you know, they have uh, all sorts of lanes, uh, bike lanes and pedestrian access uh, as along with the car stuff. But, you know, the key is, you know, this is a functional working harbor. Um, the bridge has to be able to lift in order to allow some of the larger ships to get through to, uh, to some industrial parts on the old harbor side there. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> instead of just, you know, thinking practically, you know, maybe investing half that amount in refurbishing the current bridge uh, or building, you know, a little bit more... Um, uh, finding a more experienced contractor or a contractor who could deliver on sort of the more experienced uh, project, a uh, project that's been done elsewhere. Uh, they decide to reinvent the wheel, and of course, you know, taxpayers end up paying for that. What else uh, made your uh, government waste award? Well, you know, the municipal nominees. So uh, the city of Victoria won that, and to Mayor Lisa helps credit. I mean, she voted against that uh that bridge back when she was on uh, city council before she became mayor. So uh, maybe she was a little bit more willing to accept the award than most. But the municipal category this year has some really, like, kind of funny ones. Funny in that, you know, you can't believe people are wasting money this way. 
sad for the taxpayers involved. So um, the city of Montreal, they were nominated for expensive fake tree stumps. This is a three and a half million dollar project where um, the city of Montreal is buying and installing 27 granite tree stumps on Mount Royal for uh, the city's 375th anniversary. So um, they just say it's art. It's not a stump. It's a piece of art. Um, why the world needs granite tree stumps uh, is beyond us, but you know, $3.75 million. And then we had some really weird expense claims. So the CAO of uh, the County of Richmond in Nova Scotia, which is a tiny, tiny little office in uh, tiny little municipality in Nova Scotia, he expensed $96,448. Um, really, just unbelievable ways. So, you know, he exaggerated his mileage, $429 limousine ride um, on a business trip in Houston, double dipped meal expenses, you know, taking a per diem and submitting a receipt. But then also, um, you know, spent $582 at a local strip club while in Houston. Um, not surprisingly, he was forced to resign after all that came to light. There was also a uh, Edmonton city manager who spent $140,000 uh, in three and a half years on just taxpayer-funded trips. So he made 52 trips in three and a half years on the job. He spent 212 days uh, in that three-year span working outside the city, approved all his own travel, um, basically a quarter of his time spent elsewhere, Russia, U.S., Australia, and then finally got fired. So... Um, you know, some pretty questionable expenses from uh, some people who should know a lot better. Do governments have good control on personal expenses like that? I mean, we look at the Senate scandal, for example. Yeah, I think the, the rule of thumb is if you're allowed to make your own rules um, and you're the one signing your own expense forms, uh, there are not good controls over you. I mean, uh, that's where these guys came, uh, got into trouble is they were approving their own expenses. They weren't you know, accountable to anyone. And the council certainly weren't keeping a close enough eye on it. Um, and so they, uh, they abused the system. Um, you know, the same could be argued for the senators, right? They set their own rules. Um, and, you know, they expense their, uh, expense a bunch of things that may or may not have uh, been allowed. So, yeah, the, the less accountability you have, the less oversight you have, the more likely it is that uh, the expenses are going to go bad, which is why we're constantly pushing for you know, strong rules, clear rules, and regular accounting of all these different um, uh, CAOs and, and heads of organizations. Should people in government have to post their uh, expense bills every year? Yeah, absolutely. It's something we've pushed for a long time. we made progress uh, across the country. Nova Scotia was actually the first to post their MLA expenses online. Now uh, British Columbia does it after several years of pushing for it. Um, but, yeah, it should extend to, you know, any... Any public servant who has the ability to approve their own expense account should have those expenses posted online so that watchdog organizations, uh, media, uh, and individual taxpayers can take a look and see what their money is being spent on. Should politicians in Canada have to disclose more of their personal finances? That's an interesting question. I mean, the MLAs have to you know, talk about who they owe money to, uh, companies they own shares, and properties they own. So I think that's a, probably a, a fair enough uh thing you know you can make the argument that you know the american system before trump you know the presidential candidates being forced to release their tax return uh you know that it does give you a window into their financial life uh, at the same time i do think that even public officials do have some uh, they should have retain some form of privacy like I, I'm not I'm not so keen on seeing individual tax returns released just because you know I think people do have a right to make a living before they enter public life and and uh, yeah I'm not I'm just not sure what problem we'd be trying to solve by by forcing that. Of course, you know we look at some jurisdictions, say the president of Russia, who probably officially makes one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year, and yet he's worth fifty billion. Where did that money come from? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not sure though that, you know, even the most, uh, <laughs> even the most corrupt, uh, public official in Canada can hold a candle to, uh, to the president of Russia. And if the NSA or the, uh, KGB is listening to this recording, it was, uh, Jim Goddard who mentioned, uh, Mr. Putin, not me. Well, thanks a lot, Jordan Bateman. <laughs> we'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after the break. 
Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. A big fuss in Vancouver about the city changing its logo. Uh, block letters, no other graphics along with it, green and, and blue. To me, if I was marking that logo class, I'd give the kid a C. And the current city logo, I don't see anything wrong with it. Everybody I've talked to likes it. But the mayor got very upset when people asked him questions about it. Were those questions viable? Oh, absolutely. The mayor needs to be questioned on that. Um, the mayor needs to be questioned on this whole logo debacle. So at one point, the mayor gave an interview saying he found the old logo lame, and that's why he was so keen on getting a new one. Um, the new one then turns out just to be a, a word stamp, which frankly looks suspiciously like the, uh, the city of Chilliwax logo, uh, right down to the same Gotham font. Um, spend eight thousand dollars just on the design, let alone you know what actually costs to rebrand everything. And then you know they bring it out to council and say, you know, yeah, we'll vote for this. We're going to phase it in just as things you know, need to be replaced. Uh, we'll do, you know, we'll we'll roll it out. Um, they vote on it. Sure enough, Penny Daflos, the CTV reporter, leaves the council meeting to go file her report for CTV. Walks past the receptionist desk at City Hall, and there are. Um, City of Vancouver uh, glossy cards already out with the uh, new logo on it. Um, so clearly, uh, unless they had run out in the uh, five minutes that they were making this vote, um, clearly the uh, the the uh, they were shown to be lying about them phasing it in. Then, you know, after public pressure, um, after a really interesting Vancouver Metro story where uh, local designers just kicked the snot out of this uh, out of this new design, then you get. Um, the mayor backtracking just unilaterally saying, no, I'm pulling the logo, we're not going to use it, we'll use the old one, and we'll talk about it more. Well, Jim, um, in Canada, the mayor doesn't actually have the power to override council decisions that he sees fit. He actually has to go back to council and get a resolution to counteract the uh, any other resolution that's already passed. Council has voted on that. They passed that, uh, that new logo. Um, and now he had just unilaterally decided that uh, he was going to override council decisions. So... A little bit of a, a sign of the kind of dictatorship and um, uh, arrogance of power that Gregor Robertson has so comfortably settled into after a decade as mayor of Vancouver. Um, and, you know, good on the media for holding him to account. $8,000 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but once you start rolling out all the ancillary items you're talking about, so probably a quarter million dollars, if not far more, in actually rebranding Vancouver. So, uh, again, I, sometimes governments cite, like, they, just, they get so wrapped up in their own world that they forget that you know their actual real problems. And I'm not sure what the problem is that Gregor Robertson was trying to solve with the new logo. Can I invite people to go online and take a look at what is the current logo, or maybe are we talking about the new old logo? But the one they wanted to replace it with, block letters. Truly, no imaging at all. No, and that was one of the weird things they were saying. At one point, they were touting it that they needed a new logo and brand because so many people were settling here who don't speak English as a first language. Okay, so they get rid of the only graphic element in the logo, which is that you know kind of flower slash mountain slash water uh, little mark at the top. Well, so you know these people don't speak English, and wanting to reach out to them by what? We're getting rid of the only graphic element in the actual. In the actual logo, like, they just blundered through this completely. It was clearly the arrogance of 
the arrogance of Greg Robertson wanting this thing done because um, he found the old one quote unquote lame, and uh, and that was the way it was. Well, yes, and when you talk about auxiliary costs. How many city vehicles are there that would have to have a new logo? How many welcoming signs to the city? Those things aren't cheap. No, and, you know, they'll phase them in much faster than the private sector. It's funny, I was at Shaw Tower today filming some questions for Voice of BC, and uh, one of the pieces of equipment had an old um, uh, BC TV News Hour logo, you know, the uh, the four, four or five colors, the circle, and it was a little pinwheel. Um, and it was like, I was shocked to see it. It's been so long since I'd seen that logo, and you know the news hour now is rebranded, and you know it's become global and and all of that. And you know, in in the private sector, you sometimes get an old logo that slips through like that, but you can bet that government, with you know endless resources, um, would quickly uh, switch over to the new logo, and the old one would be excised completely. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's just one of those things where you, you wonder what they were thinking, why they were bothering. Um, and, you know, you just shake your head and say, look, they focus on the important things in government. You know, you've got a fentanyl crisis. You've got uh, high housing costs. Um, you know, you're whining and complaining to senior levels of government constantly. Um, but, you know, about needing more money and them needing to manage things better. And yet you're, you know, blundering around with $8,000 logos. It, it just doesn't make sense. We'll have more with Jordan Bateman right after this. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Keep informed. Receive our weekly recap of thought-provoking articles, podcasts, and radio delivered to your inbox for free. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage, HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Jordan Bateman from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, BC branch. Jordan, the Trump brothers came here to Vancouver to open up the new Trump Hotel Policing costs for the city and the RCMP out of this world, should the Trumps have to reimburse the city for the overtime paid to the cops? Well, I guess the argument could also be made, should the protesters be forced to pay uh, to reimburse for the cops? I mean, it's chicken or the egg. What came first, the Trump brothers or the protest? Um, look, you know, people invest in, uh, in a city. They're building, uh, they build a shiny new building. You've got to expect that there's going to be an opening. Um, they're paying taxes here for, or the building will pay taxes here for the next, uh, you know, 50 or 60 years with, uh, as that property is here. So I'm not, I'm not so picky on, on that kind of stuff. You know, it's not like they invited the protest or, or wanted, uh, costs to, uh, to grow. Uh, I think it's kind of, it would be unfair to ding them and not, not other people. Um, you know, think of the 420 celebrations that take over the parks. Um, you know, we don't make the organizers pay for the policing costs of those. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to, to rationalize why you ding them. Yes, uh, in fact, the uh, pot rally, they asked for a permit to gather at Sunset Beach, and uh, the park board turned them down, and they said it's just marijuana prejudice because if they had asked for a liquor license, they would have got one. Yeah, well, good point. I mean, we allow... Uh, beer gardens and parks all the time. Uh, in fact, competing with uh, those businesses that you actually go out and do the licensing and all the important things. So, yeah, it's a fair point. Um, you know, I've talked with Jody Emery about this issue in the past and, and her frustration with, you know, the promises that were made by Justin Trudeau to change marijuana laws, the lack of speed that his government is taking, is tackling those issues with. Um, and, and then the fact that, you know, they're still throwing people in jail. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister comes to Victoria and Vancouver and says that all these marijuana dispensaries should be closed. Uh, and people, you know, should be punished uh, according to the law. And yet it's a law that he says is unjust and wants to change. So I, I, I don't know how, I don't know how Trudeau gets away with that kind of double talk. I mean, it should be, it should be something that uh, his voters punish him for. Well, 10,000 Canadians a year, I believe end up with criminal records because of marijuana for simple possession. 
Uh, years ago, in the city of Seattle, they had a referendum that told the police there to make the enforcement of marijuana laws their very last priority. In other words, go out and ticket dogs without a license or without a leash before you go and bust somebody for a joint. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, bluntly, uh, bluntly, can I say, can I use that word uh, in a marijuana conversation? You can uh, say whatever you like. Honestly, I think the, you know, the Vancouver Police Department have turned a blind eye to most of the activities. I mean, you see in other cities, these uh, dispensaries open, and, you know, that same day they're being closed down by bylaws and, and police. That just doesn't happen in Vancouver, so uh, I guess the chances are the, uh, the police department has been told to focus on other on other priorities. Yeah, because there seems to be a lot more. Uh, and I actually found when I moved to Vancouver, the police in Vancouver had the attitude, I don't know if it's the same today, where they were more peace officers than law enforcement officers. As long as everybody was getting along and nobody was getting hurt, they were willing to stand by and supervise. RCMP, on the other hand, are law enforcement officers first. Yeah, I think it, that comes with the culture of the department, right, and the locale they're in. The RCMP being a national force, training everyone from coast to coast the same way. Uh, you know, the, the fact that you have many non-British Columbians working in BC RCMP headquarters as, you know, chiefs and, uh, well, superintendents and, and officers. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe if it was more kind of localized like Vancouver is, which generally draws its, uh, its members from the Vancouver area, uh, you know, maybe they would have that difference in, uh, in philosophy. It's a good point. I mean, so it's a point that, you know, I, I never really put my finger on, but it certainly does describe uh, the differences between local police forces and the RCMP. Also, too, from a taxpayers' federation, anytime somebody's busted, that costs money. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. I mean, think of all the uh, small drug issues that get wrapped up in court. Uh, you know, there's a push in Victoria to hire more uh, court bailiffs or then sheriffs in order to uh, uh, to process more court more uh, cases. You wonder if you didn't have all the drug cases in there, all the marijuana cases if that would be enough to, uh, to open a bit of capacity. So, yeah, I mean, look, I've talked with the Emery's about this. You know, um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit agnostic on the whole thing. I've never, you know, marijuana legalization is not a burning issue for me by any stretch of the imagination. But at the same time, I certainly can see the, uh, the fiscal case they make. Plus, uh, places like Washington State and Oregon are making two to three times as much tax money as they expected to. And uh, in some cases, they're wondering where to put all this surplus money. Well, it's not quite the cash cow that um, they originally thought. Uh, certainly, the police savings have not been nearly as high as they thought it was going to be. So um, some revenue is a little bit higher. Some expenditures are also haven't dropped as much as they thought. That said, um, you know, when Trudeau finally does get around to legalizing marijuana, it's very important that if he wants it to be a success, that he not tax it like liquor or cigarettes because there is an entrenched black market, on obviously, in marijuana production. And the whole point of this exercise is to get rid of the organized crime, uh, organized crime and, and the gangs, get them out of the business. And uh, if you're taxing the legal product too much, um, people will just uh, continue to buy the contraband. Well, they've run into that por- problem in Portland where they now want to make private sales illegal because it's cutting into uh, the profits for the state. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, again, it's about getting the bad guys out of drugs, uh, out of the drug trade. Um, if it's about pushing them out, listen, you know, it's one of the dirty little secrets in BC. We have a very robust cigarette um, contraband trade. Um, there was a study done at UBC looking at cigarette butts that were left behind by students. Something like uh, you know, one in three were uh, were contraband, smuggled in from uh, somewhere else, or uh, or created by. Uh, uh, organized get, organized crime. So, um, you know, if you want to get rid of uh, these these uh, trades, uh, these gangs, the best way to do it is to choke their money out, and uh, and that means you've got to price it at a uh, at a rate that makes sense to people. It means you can't tax it at you know 100 percent or 200 percent like you do with uh, with tobacco. And I've seen some of the uh, counterfeit brands. They look j- legit. They've got the tax uh, green plastic stripe and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, and in BC we get a certain kind of contra contraband. In um, Ontario and Quebec, a lot of it's done on the First Nations reserves. 
um, you know, these are huge money generators, and the money's not going to, you know, mom and pop or, you know, really nice people. It's going to very bad people who uh, use the money for nefarious purposes. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I've done a lot. I, you know, I, I've talked at, you know, marijuana industry conferences, trying to get them, trying to push them to not settle for allowing government to have liquor or, or tobacco-like control over their product. Um, you know, if you sell this through liquor stores, then government's going to want to be in the uh, marijuana distribution business. That's going to cut into the ability of the private sector to make profit. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of issues when it comes to marijuana legalization, and uh, frankly, it's it's probably the most uh, interesting public policy experiment that Canada is going to undertake uh, this decade and, and maybe in the last several decades. Well, uh, in BC, you don't see much resistance to it, but I'm sure in very conservative areas, Alberta, for example, they still think marijuana is uh, the footprint of the devil. Yeah, you still see those odd newspaper columnists too, right, who, uh, who talk about the gateway drug and the slippery slope and, and all of that. Um, and that's you know part of what the industry has to do, right, is educate people as to what's really going on and then invest some of their money in the proper health studies um, to make sure that, uh, you know, the claims that they've been making about marijuana all these years are true. Jordan, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, my pleasure. My guest has been Jordan Bateman, the B.C. Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. His website, taxpayer.com. You're listening to The Goddard Report. I am Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on The Goddard Report and talkdigitalnetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at talkdigitalnetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.